What's my favorite kind of summer? One that is barefoot and unforgettable. When I was a child, I spent my summers with my granny and papa. I would leave Nashville and go about an hour and a half south to Tullahoma, Tennessee, and spend the entire summer with my granny and papa. They lived out on land in the middle of the country, or at least to me, what was the country. And outside of a few weeks of church camp, that's where my summers were. I remember so many things about those summers. I had the undivided attention of my granny and papa. I was able to run around without shoes on. And I learned so many things. I learned how to sew and cook and bake. I learned all of the ins and outs of gardening and how to can. During those summers, they were my favorite times of the year. And I still love summer. I still love thinking back to those memories. I remember sitting on the front porch swing with my grandmother, letting the rain hit the tin roof above us and just listening and talking about life. I remember running around with my cousins who lived in the same town, playing pretend and stomping around in the wet grass. And I remember watching The Price is Right promptly at 10 o'clock with my grandfather every weekday as we sat and broke beans fresh from the garden. All of the fresh vegetables, all of the sunshine, all of the heat, I loved it all. And I loved that shoes were optional. I remember when I finally realized that these summers wouldn't last forever. It was the summer that I got my permit to drive and I was driving around with my grandmother and I realized I was gonna have to get a job and I wouldn't be able to go to the country for the summers. I also remember the moment I realized that Granny and Papa weren't going to be there forever. And at that moment, those moments of realization are when I realized that my grandparents' home in Tullahoma, Tennessee was indeed holy and sacred ground and that time was God given. In the Bible, there's a story about a man named Moses. He had lived in Egypt and run away after killing someone. When he was in the wilderness where he'd run to, he was taken in by a family. He married this daughter of a man named Jethro and started working as a part of the family business, tending to sheep. It was while he was tending to this herd, this herd of sheep, that he was in the wilderness again. And out of the corner of his eye, he saw a burning bush. Now, many of us, if we saw a burning bush, would put it out before we had a chance to do anything else. But Moses saw this burning bush and went over to investigate. He almost missed it. It was just in the corner of his eye. And as he went over to this burning bush, he heard a voice saying, Moses, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. Moses did as the voice said, and then God spoke, telling him that he was going to send Moses back to Egypt to liberate the people of Israel so that they could then go to the promised land. Moses definitely didn't think he was right for this job, but it's crazy that he almost missed God in this space because he was so wrapped up in doing this common task that he did on a day to day. Moses was in a space of the wilderness and God chose to spoke, speak to him there. Moses wasn't at some beautiful oasis Moses definitely wasn't in the land of milk and honey where he would lead the Israelite people to later on. Moses was doing his day-to-day -day tasks and God spoke to him there, saying that this ground in which he probably didn't consider to be anything special was holy. What about us? What are the places we consider to be holy ground? Maybe it's a church. 
Maybe it's the top of a mountain after a bike ride. Maybe it's that beach we go to once a year. Or maybe it's that one magical trip to another country that we had one time in our life where we truly felt connected to God. Maybe we don't think of standing at the kitchen sink washing off dried oatmeal as a holy place or folding our kids' laundry. Maybe we don't think of pulling weeds in the garden as a holy time or sitting at that awkwardly silent dinner table as holy space. But through the story of Moses, God shows us that holy ground is everywhere and that we have to be a, maybe a little bit more attentive and present to see it. God is all about equal opportunity. God will use any ground, any space, any time, any person, any experience to show the love, the grace, the justice that can be brought about in this world through you and I. When I realized that my grandparents' house was holy ground, that's when I started to pay attention to things that had been going on for years, but I realized God was calling me in the midst of. I paid attention to the fact that my grandparents would get up every morning and would read the Bible, read the upper room and their devotion together, sharing in a cup of coffee in these mugs. I paid attention to my grandmother's need to share compassion and hospitality with anyone who came through her door or through the door of the church, making sure that there was a casserole for every church event, funeral, wedding, or anything else, and that anyone who came to her house never left empty-handed. I learned that part of my call to ministry was to try and live into the things that they had taught me, not because they told me I needed to get up and read the Bible and do a devotion, but because that's how they lived it. And when I paid attention to that space being holy ground, that's when I started to see that God was speaking to me through them. Now, you might say, I hear God speaking, I hear God calling, but God, I think you have the wrong number. And that happens too. Moses, who would end up leading the Israelite people out of Egypt and out of slavery, said the exact same thing. Try the next house down. But Moses, after some persistence from God, realized, I'm called and God will equip me to do the things that I need. So what is God calling you to? And what is God calling you to in the midst of the mundane? Is God calling you to a place in which you're listening to your spouse go on and on and on, and you're really just being called to be an active listener to them in that moment? Is God emailing you to maybe be gentle with that driver that's in front of you who seems like they're taking forever and you've been in the car for so long, but they just could not handle one more person honking at them or being upset with them? Maybe God is nudging you to smile at a stranger while you're at happy hour because you see the pain that's in their eyes. Or maybe God is calling you to mentor a child that seems to just be around a lot, but you don't know why. God is interesting in the way that he can use the mundane to do the miraculous. And God can use a situation without consuming it, just like that bush. God can use a situation of making dinner with your spouse and having a conversation to show your spouse a way of love that maybe they haven't experienced in a while without fully taking over the experience of making dinner. God can use a simple conversation with a friend on a core trail that you've walked, it seems like a million times, to share a lens of hope that maybe they wouldn't see. God is active in this world and is here for you and I calling, 
And God is persistent in that calling. Think about Jonah. Jonah was a man that God had called to come and share the good news with people. And he said no and no and no. And God chased him all the way to the ocean, into the belly of a whale. And eventually, Jonah got with it. So even if you think, maybe I've missed out on so many of God's calls, what's the use? Just start paying attention. Because God can and wants to use you to share love, hope, peace, grace, and joy with this world. God wants to use you to liberate those that are in bondage. God wants to use you to love those who feel unloved. So my friends, pay attention and live a summer in which presence is required, but shoes are optional, for we are all standing on holy ground.